quanta gente c'è, poi me lo dici. Ok. okay. So, uh, good morning everybody, we switch to English because this plenary session is in English. Uh, I just uh, use a few uh, minutes to say some practical information because I think that there are many of you that attend this conference and not the, this uh, session and not the previous one. Be careful for those that the session starts and uh, is uh, starts and stops exactly at the time of the program. So be uh, on time and especially uh, um, end on time. Otherwise, you are, your word is cut. Eh? Uh, the, please, for, the, for those who chair, please check how many people are attending the, con the, the, your session and provide this information to, to the secretary. Uh, we have a new program, well, an updated program. It hasn't changed a lot, but you can download it. Please download the new program from the website uh, this morning, so you are sure you have the last information, the most updated information. Uh, and that's it. Uh, so uh, now we start our session. Uh, we have one hour and, and a half, and I am really pleased to welcome uh, our, um, let's say, our mm, in, invited uh, people, invited speakers, on the theme of regions and the uh, health uh, emergency, uh, we, which means uh, we have uh, opportunities and threats. Uh, uh, we have three very good and very well-known speakers. The first one is Professor Giuseppe Arbia uh, from the Catholic Università Cattolica del Sacro Cuore. He will speak about uh, spatial temporal trends in Italian pandemia. And then we move to uh, Richard Grivenson, who is from uh, WIIW from Vienna, is the uh, vice director, so he has also a, an important role. Um, he will speak about Central and Eastern European after COVID-19 uh, and the challenges and opportunities in a, in different, in a different global economy. And the third one is, Territoria, is Andrea Conte from the Joint Research Center of the European Commission, uh, DG Regio, uh, Territorial Impact of Codic Crisis, Monitoring and Evaluation Tools to Support Better Design of Policies. We have heard a lot if you were at the URSA conference last week, and I have to say that all speakers all uh, were um, interesting, uh, the speakers that were speaking about COVID in the plenary uh, sessions, but missed any kind of quantitative evidence. I think that we are going to fill that gap to this morning and we are going to have um, a lot of, uh, let's say, uh, empirical uh, uh, empirical uh, trends and empirical figures uh, that, sorry, figures are always empirical, empirical evidence that uh, of what is happening and what could happen under certain conditions. So I don't use any uh, more time, I, 20 minutes for each speaker. And then if you want to, the, the people that are attending, if they want to speak, you can either raise your hands uh, and uh, then speak or uh, send a, a message. So please, Giuseppe, the floor is yours. Uh, you can share your screen with us. Thank you for, okay. for being with us. Mm. OK, thank you, Roberta. Uh, so I share my screen. Uh, let me know if everything works well. Um, so uh, I don't hear anything, so I guess um, this is correct. OK, uh, yes, uh, you made a, a nice introduction, Roberta, and um, uh, thank you for this. Uh, as you anticipated, uh, my paper is uh, uh, highly empirical for, for my background and uh, well, uh, the task that has been given to me is to talk about spatial temporal uh, trends in Italian uh, pandemia. Uh, what I'm going to do is to introduce uh, some empirical work on this, but I want to make a, uh, a, 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 a an introduction, which will be a, a very large introduction. In fact, it will occupy half of my talk on data quality. I think this is my, um, in some sense, this mm, uh, I, my obligation. I have to do this because uh, in, in the recent uh, epidemia, 
we have been uh, um, bombed with a series of models and uh, uh, and of uh, empirical applications, which in many instances are not well grounded due to data quality. So even if the title of my talk is a spatial temporal trend, as I said, I will devote at least half of my talk to discuss data quality problems. And in doing this, I will present some of my most recent contribution in the area. OK, so I start with data quality and uh, there is no need to make any um, uh, um, further talk about the importance of having accurate evaluation of the sources of data in the worldwide uh, emergency uh, connected with the spread of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, uh, only in this way, if we have the availability of accurate data, we are able to monitor the evolution, to support the decision makers and to evaluate the effects of the restrictive measures that are introduced. OK, one problem, which is something and I have been talking about in the last months, all the times that I had the occasion to, is that data are not collected with statistical purposes. They are collected until, until now, at least, with few remarkable exceptions, only favoring the examination of cases that already display symptoms. And this is what in statistics we call convenience sampling. Convenience sampling is uh, uh, the topic that we teach to our students in the first class of statistics. We say there is random sampling and there is convenience, non-probabilistic sampling. With non-probabilistic sample, it's not possible to build up probability of inclusions to calculate probability on inclusion, so uh, it's not possible to make any uh, sound probabilistic inference. So, sadly, most of the works that we have seen and that we still see nowadays in this period of uh, epidemia uh, is basically wrong. Estimates are biased, confidence interval when provided are simply nonsense, and forecasts are often unreliable. OK, so let me speculate a bit about this. Um, in particular, with the epidemia, what we have seen that there is a strong evidence of underestimation of the number of infected people. There is a huge literature on this, on um, many uh, medical and statistical journals. And apart from this, from the problem connected with non-random sampling and the underestimation, we have self-selection bias, measurement errors, different definitions adopted in different countries, which make almost impossible to make any re a reliable inference. So I cannot avoid to devote the first part of my talk to this topic here. And in particular, what I want to discuss is here is an ad hoc strategy for a sample survey, which I have proposed together with a, a group uh, constituted by Aleva, Falorzi, Nardelli and Zuliani. The paper is already on ARCSIV uh, and it's accessible and is currently under a second review for the Journal of Official Statistics. We propose a sampling method. I'm going to show you only a few details on this. I was just want to concentrate on the good property of this method and on the necessity of implementing not necessarily this method, but something close to this in order to have a reliable data set. Now, our idea is basically to classify the individuals into two subgroups. The first subgroup is the subgroup of individuals for which a state of infection has already been verified. So that's the traditional sample. And then group B, the second group, contains both healthy people for which the infection is considered as latent, together with those who are still in a phase of incubation where the symptoms can become evident in the future. So that's the, the basic idea. We uh, include in the sample both uh, individuals with and without symptoms, and the estimates are obtained using methods which are largely uh, known in the statistical um, literature and are based on indirect sampling, which are commonly used for rare and elusive populations. So, is uh, <clears throat> surprising that this hasn't been used in this particular case. And what we pr propose is a repeated sample survey, so a panel. We get some individuals, we follow them, and we see what is the evolution of the epidemics through them. <clears throat> so 
uh, uh, this is important not only to measure the effective reduction of infection, which we are expecting these days, but also what is the proportion of population that had contacts with them in the past. So this is important, especially in the declining phase of the epidemics, which is what we were experiencing until a few uh, days ago, I would say. So let's see what is going to happen now. But what is important is that we follow these um, in different moments of time through a different waves of a panel. OK, so details, as I said, are contained in the archive uh, paper, uh, which is uh, available. What I'm going to show you is something interesting is a Monte Carlo study of this um, before I move to the second part of my talk. OK, what we use is the simple uh, SEER model where we distinguish the population in susceptible, infected with symptoms and healed with three differential equations. We will go back to this later on. And we made a further improvement of this model. So we consider a revised model where we consider susceptible exposed to the virus, infected with symptoms and infected without symptoms, the asymptomatics, and the removed are either healed or dead. OK, but we are going to what we did was to build up uh, a simulation where uh, there are several hypotheses. I'm not going to bore you on this, but, but there is a, a special aspect on that because we consider the data laid on a five by five regular square lattice grid and the number of people in each of this square, which we can imagine like uh, the region in Italy, uh, is a random number drawn from a uniform between 800 and 1,000 individuals. So in the end, we had a population, a fake population, artificial population of 22,000 individuals. And we had several hypotheses on mobility. Now, the best way of showing what we did here is to display this, uh, uh, um, uh, um, if it works, um, this graph here, now let me, Perhaps I have to do this. Yeah, OK, so this is the simulation. You see there are the uh, 25 regions and there is mobility of individuals that go from one to the other. And in the third panel, outbreaks is the plot of the number of infected people. And in the right panel, you see the evolution of the infected, of the exposed. And then we have the black curve, which represents the number of deaths uh, in the period of consider. So there is a lockdown at a certain point here, which reduces the mobility. You see that after a while, individuals do not move anymore as they did before. So this is interesting. Um, let me go back here because we managed, despite the many assumptions that we had to do, the situation is very close to what happened in, in reality. OK, so let me show you some simulation results about our uh, our sampling method. Uh, we have considered three waves of a sample in day 15, day 25 and day 35. At day 15 is the outbreak, phase one. Day 25 is still phase one, but it's close to the plateau. And day 35 is uh, when, um, oh, I missed something. Uh, is when we are after the period of lockdown. OK, uh, I'm checking uh, the time that I have at disposal. OK, let me enlarge this. Uh, the method works very, very well. The sample, the, uh, there is a, a relative absolute bias that is very, very small and relatively to the simple random sample, which is the benchmark, the method works much, much better. That's the ratio between the standard error of our method and that of uh, uh, the simple random. So. Our sample plan provides estimators that are unbiased and that largely outperform simple random sampling in terms of, of efficiency. We prove this also formally in our paper. OK, so provided we have reliable data, we can try and build up some spatial and spatial temporal uh, models to forecast the future evolution. OK, so uh, let me start with some evidence. We said at the beginning that we are going to show some uh, empirical numbers and I haven't done so far. So some comforting evidence. Are we close to the worldwide peak? It seems so. In the last days, it seems that the worldwide as the number of cases is peaking. 
but there is also some contrasting scaling evidence. If we remember the three waves of Spanish virus epidemics, 1918, 1919, where uh, after five months there was a secondary peak, lower but still important peak. And uh, so that's the number of deaths per thousand person. Uh, if we look at Italy, we are not in this situation. That's the, uh, uh, the graph of the deaths. And apart from uh, an exceptional value, which was registered at about uh, mid-August, it's declining. We don't see the secondary peak, which unfortunately we see in terms of new cases in Italy. There is a, a re, re, uh, uh, um, an increase of the number of new cases recently that could be linked with a, 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 secondary, a secondary wave. OK, so provided we had a, a, a good data, what we could do is to build up a space time dynamic model, which is the second part of my talk, uh, and I should have still half of my time at disposal. Um, and um, I always start with a classical deterministic uh, SEER model once again. So the three equation that describes the uh, susceptible, the infected and the removed. Uh, and that's the equation. We have the three parameters, which is the beta transmission rate, gamma recovery rate, and R0, which is the important number. We have been discussing this in Italy several um, uh, times in the, in the past, because it says uh, uh, how many individuals are infected by each infected person, okay, on the average. Okay, what, what I, I did in, uh, in, a, in a recent paper is to try and describe this in finite difference representation. OK, so uh, instead of having continuous time, we have a, a simple discrete time and a unitary step of delta t equal one and the simplifying assumption, which is largely accepted that s t divided by n is equal to one. So this acceptable coincides with the population. OK, if we do this, this equation becomes redundant, and in this equation is a set of two equations where delta i is a function of r and delta r is a function of i. So if we, re by repeated substitution, we build up a single equation which describes the model, which is this equation here, okay? This is our starting point for spatial modeling. Okay, so, so far the classical literature, what I consider is a stochastic version of our model, considering the fact that the quantity are not known without error. And specifically we have measurement error and random error. And I consider in the recent paper both of them. Uh, I skip on measurement error, but I just want to show you that there is a good news about this, because if the measurement error is connected with the asymptomatic, and if the asymptomatic is a constant fraction, a constant proportion of the symptomatics, then this uh, uh, proportion is irrelevant for estimating beta, gamma, and R0, is irrelevant to determining the day of the uh, peak, but obviously is relevant to determining the number of infected people at peak time and uh, at the daily peak time. OK, most importantly, the second part is on random error. So I consider again the equation here, this peak uh, time equation, and I add an error component, which uh, since this is number of individuals, delta I is the increase in the number of infected. So it's uh, reasonable to assume a Poisson process with the parameter lambda, let's say. And uh, but if we can assume that, sorry, um, if we can assume that lambda is large as it is possible, then this could be approximated with the normal distribution. OK, so we write the model in this way, which clearly is a model uh, which belongs to the class of the autoregressive integ integrated moving average uh, <coughs> with an additional autoregressive component. There is no space so far, OK? And we introduce the spatial component, which is dominant in uh, epidemics, obviously. We add an index i, which corresponds, let's say, for instance, to a region. OK, so we have the same equation, which is the basic uh, summarized SEER model, stochastic SEER model, uh, and it is regionalized. So it's the dynamic panel data model. OK, and then we introduce a spatial lag in order to have the introduce the characteristic of spatial diffusion. So this is the original model and we add this component here, which is a 
spatial lag through the definition of a weight matrix, W, which incorporates the links of proximity between regions, mm -hmm. uh, so that the increase in the number of infected is a function at time t in region I is a function of the increase at time t minus one in region I uh, is a function of the absolute value of I t minus two region I and is a function of the increase in the uh, um, uh, previous moment of time in the neighboring regions, mm. taking into account so uh, the possibility of contagion between uh, regions. Okay, when I say regions, I say a partition of the of space. Okay, so the the last improvement of the model is to consider that the error can be split into two components. One is the um, component which is typical of the region, we call this mu i, and the second one is the idiosyncratic component, eta t i. So this is the basic structure of a fixed effect spatial panel model, and the mu i, the set of mu i's, become some further parameters that can be estimated. Okay, so let me go close to the conclusions, and when I look at the clock, I don't know why this happens, but and I'm going to show you some result, preliminary result, examining the, uh, uh, the diffusion of SARS in Italy in the uh, 107 Italian provinces in the period from February 24th to May 18th, where we had uh, um, official data uh, provided by the Protezione Civile. Uh, the definition of the W matrix is based on the first four neighbors. So we consider for each province the first four closest provinces based on the coordinates of the centroid. I tried with different W matrices and it doesn't change dramatically uh, the results. Okay, so that's the estimation of our model. You see that the estimates are all very highly significant. The coefficient of the, uh, let me go back to the equation here, we have the component delta I uh, T minus one I, the component I T minus two I, and the component uh, W, uh, um, uh, uh, delta i t minus one i through the parameter rho, which is the spatial correlation parameter. Okay, all of these are highly significant and spatial correlation is positive and highly significant. Now, as I said, we can also estimate the mu i. The mu i are the, uh, uh, um, the regional effects and this is, uh, and this is the plot of the spatial fixed effect. So we can see this as the spatially varying intercept, which incorporate the levels of the increase in the number of infected people that cannot be ascribed to the model. So it cannot be ascribed to temporal trend, neither to a temporal trend nor to spatial contagion. And so here we highlight, for instance, some provinces, the, the, the dark blue, which are structurally more prone to the epidemic diffusion, no matter what is the time trend and what is the surrounding, the behavior of the surrounding provinces. But remember here, beware quality data, quality, uh, data quality issues that I said at the beginning. Okay, so let me move to the conclusions. Uh, in, if we want to tame the pandemics, is essential to collect data, not only for healthcare purposes, which is the most important, but also for statistical purposes. Otherwise, all our modeling efforts are useless. Before judging any modeling results, the quality of the data should be accurately verified. And in general, do not trust models that do not discuss what is the quality of the data. If more accurate data will become available in the future, uh, the framework that I presented here for epidemic forecast based on spatial panel data, which I show can be derived directly from the uh, typical uh, uh, SIR, the SIR model, can be a promising modeling framework. Okay, thank you very much for your attention, and I hope I managed to stay within the time limits. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Thank you, Giuseppe, for this interesting uh, um, issue, uh, data quality. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, we are strict in time, so I would keep one or two questions for the end. So now I move. I, I don't know how to uh, 
signal to the speaker uh, the time. So that's my problem. So I would kindly ask uh, our uh, Richard uh, to uh, keep the time to 10, uh, maximum 10 uh, uh, or five, please. Uh, I don't know how to signal that, but that's thank you, Richard. OK, OK. So I tried to share my screen. I hope you can see that. OK. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, OK, so um, yeah, so thank you very much for the invitation. It's uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. I would, of course, prefer to be uh, there with you in Italy, but this is the world we are in uh, at the moment. Um, so my task is to talk about Central and Eastern Europe after after COVID or during and after COVID and, and the challenges and opportunities in a different global economy. Um, just to say at the start, I mean, my plan is to talk about the EU member states of Central and Eastern Europe and the Western Balkan candidate, potential candidate countries. So I won't talk so much about Russia or Turkey, but I'm happy to discuss those countries in the questions. On, in terms of the empirical aspect, um, I will actually summarize the results of maybe five or six scientific papers in this talk. So I won't go into as much detail on any, on any one paper as, as the previous speaker, but I've included links at the bottom to, to, the, to the longer papers if you're interested. And again, I would be happy to go uh, into more detail on those in the questions. So I have basically three, three parts to my presentation. Uh, the first is to look at how the crisis has affected Central and Eastern Europe so far. What are the specific characteristics of the crisis in Central and Eastern Europe? Then I will look a little bit at how the region is starting to come out of the crisis in, in, in economic terms at least and where the vulnerabilities or area of stress might be and where the, the resilience is uh, in the region. And then the third part, and this will be the, will be the main part, is to, to broaden the context a bit and ask, in the context of the development challenges that Central and Eastern Europe faces in general, also before the crisis, how does COVID-19 affect that? How does it play into that? And I think I will try to argue that there's nothing completely fundamentally new about this crisis for, for, from a Central and Eastern Europe perspective. It doesn't bring anything absolutely new, but it does have very important implications for a lot of the, the, the challenges and opportunities that the region was, was already facing. So to start just with, just with a few slides on, on the economic fallout, just to set the scene a little bit. So um, first point, I think it's probably quite well known by now, but, but important to say at the start. From a public health perspective, at least, Central and Eastern Europe has been much less affected by this pandemic than Western Europe. So here we have death rates per one million population, Western Europe on the left, Eastern Europe on the right. And you can see that the, the average, but also for almost every, every country individually, is substantially lower than, than the regional average for Western Europe. So in from a purely public health perspective, Central and Eastern Europe has been much less badly affected than, than Western Europe. From an economic perspective, though, that doesn't matter that much. It matters a bit. I will, I, will, I will show why in a minute. But the point is that even though Central and Eastern Europe had much less spread of the virus, the countries generally reacted as if they did. So this chart is from the middle of March. So when I think it was quite clear what was going on. And on the bottom, you have a number of confirmed cases at that point. And on the left, the, the stringency index from Oxford University, which shows the, the extent of lockdown measures. The orange dots are, are some Western countries and, and the gray dots are Central and Eastern Europe. And you can see that even though Central and Eastern Europe basically at this point had no cases of the virus at all and no confirmed cases of the virus, the lockdown was in general actually pretty high. Uh, the, the, the measures introduced were pretty strict already, much higher than the UK, US, uh, US, France. And so the reaction was very strong despite the lack of cases. And I think that means that in economic terms, the, the impact has been and, and will be uh, very severe as well in, in, in Central and Eastern Europe. Aside from the domestic impact, what we also wanted to look at and what we've done, done some papers on this year already is, is the external impact because Central and Eastern Europe is a region that in general has a great deal of exposure to what's happening in, in the global economy. The, the region's economies are generally pretty small, pretty open economies. And here I show just two examples. On the bottom, external trade as a share of GDP, so goods and services uh, export and import summed. And on the left, travel and tourism as a share of GDP, and that's the direct and the indirect part of travel and tourism. And you can see there are a number of countries which I, which I highlighted in red here 
the ones towards the top are the really tourism dependent economies where tourism is is 20 to 25 percent of, of the economy mostly in southeast europe and then further towards the bottom right the really trade dependent economies which tend to be the smaller visegrad countries and and slovenia and in terms of the external hit you know this collapsing global trade collapsing tourism that we see these are the countries that this year will 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 suffer the most for second quarter, so this is the, the most up-to-date GDP data that we have. Uh, this comes from, from mostly from Eurostat. Um, you can see that, so again, we have Western Europe on the left. This is real GDP change percent year on year. Western Europe on the left and, and Eastern Europe on the right. And overall, on average, the, the Eastern Europe has been less badly affected than, than Western Europe, although there are some cases, unsurprisingly, for example, Croatia, very tourism dependent, Hungary, Slovenia, very trade dependent, which have been hit pretty hard and roughly around the, the EU or the Euro area average. And I think one thing that really actually stands out from, from this chart, and it's something we've been thinking about quite a lot in, in our studies this year, is that you know, maybe there is a West-East story, but really I think the story here is more is a North-South story. And it's the, if you look furthest to the right of the chart, the Baltic states, Poland, for example, it's mostly the Northeast European countries that have been less badly affected so far. And if you look to the left of the chart, you see also that's the case in Western Europe. It's, it's the Nordic countries, Netherlands, which have also in general been less badly affected. And I think for Northeast Europe, so Baltic states, for example, the strong integration they have with the Nordic countries is act actually a factor of, uh, of resilience in this crisis. Just to reinforce a little bit also the, the point about the external shock and, and, and how much that matters for these very trade and, and sometimes tourism dependent economies. These are the high frequency data for the second quarter, tourism on the left, uh, goods exports on the right, percent change year on year. And you can see that, well, on the left, tourism basically disappeared in the second quarter. There effectively was no tourism uh, in, in countries like Croatia and Slovenia in, in April and May. In terms of goods exports also there was a huge shock and especially to the right you see the the, the smaller Visegrad countries declines of 15 to 20 percent in exports so I mean this is a huge external shock that these very uh, open economies uh, faced uh, faced in the second quarter of the year now in terms of how they have endured that and how they're coming out of that and then where the fundamental areas of stress and resilience are and this is more kind of 18 month 12 18 month uh, look into the future now the first thing to say, I think, is that in Central and Eastern Europe, since about May, there's been much more, on average, easing of lockdown measures than in Western Europe. So here is, again, the stringency index. The, the blue is Italy, which is obviously a, a stricter example. The black is Sweden, which is a famously looser example. And then the, the gray is Western Europe average. The, the orange is, is the Eastern Europe average. And, until the end of May, Western and Eastern Europe, on average, were, were, fairly, were fairly similar, but since the end of May, there's been this gap that has opened up and it's persisted right until now. So I think this speaks to the less dramatic public health aspect of the crisis that Eastern European countries have loosened lockdown measures a bit more than, than Western Europe uh, overall. And this could explain, I think, the slightly better Q2 GDP data and maybe also might suggest that, that in Q3, the, the, the economic performance of Central and Eastern Europe will be less, less bad than in, than in Western Europe. In terms of vulnerability and resilience, and this is something that we're just starting to work on, we're doing a study on this right now, but this is just a few, a few initial, initial thoughts on this. I think it's clear that Central and Eastern Europe does have some very particular vulnerabilities. One is the capacity, the quality of the healthcare system is not really comparable with Western Europe. And I think that is why they locked down so early in, in, in terms of the, at an early stage of, of the spread of the virus, and they're very cautious about that. And I think they'll remain pretty cautious about that. The tourism reliance, and that is especially Southeast Europe, the reliance on capital flows, whether that's remittances or whether that's portfolio flows or FDI, a lot. And again, Southeast Europe is very reliant on these capital flows and they have obviously struggled a lot uh, this year, unsurprisingly. A large share of SMEs in the region, small firms that don't have big cash savings. And I think this will become especially important if we have a second lockdown, second wave over the winter whether those smaller companies can survive a, a second difficult period like that. And then also in general, a limited, a limited policy space to react. And that's especially the case for the non-EU member states of the region. 
Whether it's resilience or not, I think this is important because we stress too much, I think, with Eastern Europe, the, the vulnerabilities and not enough the factors of resilience. I think there are, resi there are areas of resilience for the region. One is, as I showed already, this very quick reaction and lockdown to the virus, which was much quicker, I think, than in, than in most of Western Europe. There are some more closed economies, less trade dependent. Poland is a good is a good example of that, and that provides a certain amount of insulation from external factors. And Poland looks to have suffered much less so far than than a lot of of, of other EU countries. The international support, I think, has been very significant, and so far, I think it looks much better than after 2008. Whether that's on the macro side or or on the financial side, and that's especially for Southeast Europe, which is the region that needs it needs it most. The region has a very large allocation of, of EU funds under the various new schemes. And again, that's especially Southeast Europe, which I think needs it most. So I think uh, I'm right in saying that Bulgaria and Croatia have the biggest allocations relative to GDP of, of any country. And I think that that absolutely makes sense. And then also spillovers from the big policy response in the euro area. So even the non-euro area countries, we've seen this over the last five years. I think we'll see it again now that these spillovers uh, will come and it's another, it's another factor of resilience for the region. So that's the immediate and the, and the kind of 18 month outlook as, as we see it for, cent for Central and Eastern Europe. The last part of, of, my, of my presentation, this would be the second half, probably about 10 minutes, is to look at the development challenges that the region faces in the context of the coronavirus. So as I said at the start, I don't think there's anything really fundamentally new that comes from this crisis for the region in terms of the, the really big challenges or the big opportunities that the region has. But certainly this pandemic will have a very important impact on, on some of the existing things. And I will talk, there are four things I really want to say here and depending on time, I might mention a couple more. So the first one, and this is something we're also starting a study on now, we're still in the data collection phase, is the potential for nearshoring and digitalization. So I put this rather broad topic all in, in one basket. My initial, my hypothesis on the nearshoring hopes, and there's a lot of hope in the region that you know German companies will bring investment back from Asia to Central and Eastern Europe as a result of the pandemic. I think that is probably too optimistic, especially for this year and next. I mean, we know there are a lot of factors, a lot of decisions uh, in terms of, of where to put FDI and moving manufacturing FDI around. And we're not going to see any kind of game changer, I think, for Central and Eastern Europe as a result of the crisis. But like I say, we're starting now a study on that. So I, 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 I may change my mind depending on the results. But I think where we do see a big shift already is, is in the digital sphere. And this is something that the region really needs. Uh, Central and Eastern Europe is, a, is in general, not every country, but in general, is a laggard in terms of digitalization, development of the digital economy. And of course, this crisis has given uh, a huge push to that. This is a Eurofound data set that uh, was, recently, was recently published, survey. And it shows the number of people uh, working from home uh, as a result of this crisis who weren't working from home previously. And of course, you know, the, the, the big numbers are the countries you would expect, the Nordic countries. So we have Western Europe on the left again, Central and Eastern Europe on the right. But certainly the more advanced parts of Central and Eastern Europe, so the Baltic states and the Visegrad countries, also have seen quite a big shift basically about a third of people starting to work from home. So it shows that a lot of the economy can work in, uh, remotely can work in, in, in a digital way. And I think especially um, especially the Baltic states actually are rather strong performers in this, also compared to, to some Western European countries in, in the digital sphere. And that is something that the region needs, as I said, and I think that the, the coronavirus could well provide a pretty positive and important push in this direction for the region. The second thing, and this is again a rather broad one, and where we also have been doing quite a lot of, of research recently, is on protectionism and structural change in the automotive industry. So these two things as they go together. And these are, of course, challenges that fully predate uh, COVID. But I think especially protectionism, it seems that it's getting even bigger push from this crisis if you look at the rhetoric between between China and, and the US and then within that so within these barriers and this reduction in, in global trade volumes which of course is exacerbated by the crisis there's the particular issue of the automotive sector and this is a challenge and, and, and that's in terms of what's happened in Germany with emission scandals that's in terms of the, the, the change in, in, in environmental standards in the environmental 
priorities of, of, of consumers. And these two things put together are something that, um, in, and with coronavirus on top of that, are something that Central and Eastern Europe is very much uh, exposed to. On the left, uh, have exports as a share of GDP for all EU countries with the Eastern European countries in, in orange. And you can see that basically all of the most open economies, most trade dependent economies in the EU are in Central and Eastern Europe, and especially the Visegrad countries, Romania and, uh, and Slovenia. And then within that, there is a very strong reliance on automotive production. That's the chart on the right. So automotive production is a share of total production. And that has increased even further over the last decade. Again, especially for the Visegrad countries, Slovenia and Romania. So the region is very, very highly leveraged, I would say, on this model of a global trading system, which is open, smooth, which works, long supply chains, big demand for, for cars. And I think this was already in doubt and it's certainly been given, put into more doubt as a result of the coronavirus crisis. So this is something I think, which is a serious, a serious challenge for the region. The third challenge I wanted to touch on is, is demographics, uh, the very sharp demographic decline uh, in the region, the labor shortages, which this creates, and then what that means for automation. So we did a study last year looking at the tip, what we call the tipping point. So we modeled when labor supply will, will meet labor demand. So basically when economies will run out of workers. That's the, the, the graphic on the left, the Eastern European countries are highlighted in red. And we think that for most Central and Eastern European countries, this point is, is imminent. And we see that we see huge labor shortages in a lot of industries in the region. Now, as a result of the COVID crisis, I think this will be pushed back a bit. You know, we see already the negative impact on labor markets. We see higher unemployment rates. We will see, I think, a decline in vacancy rates, but it's not going to go away forever. I think in the next five years, this will come back as a topic, this, this labor shortage. A question and this is a huge challenge for the region for for, for growth and, and further convergence in the region however it also provides i think a very important push towards automation and that's the chart on the right and here i've highlighted you know the front runners so the us germany japan but also some central and eastern european countries and it shows multi-purpose industrial robots per 10,000 people in the automotive industry and you see that maybe with the exception of slovenia the the levels for Central and Eastern Europe as of 2017 were not that impressive. But if you look at the development since 2010, there's actually been a very rapid increase in automation in a lot of Central and Eastern European countries. And I think this is very much tied to this demographic story and the, 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 the labor shortage story. And as I said, as a result of the COVID crisis, we may see a slackening of this for, for, for some time. But I think such is the demographic crunch that the region faces. This will come back fairly, fairly quickly as a topic as well. The final point, and I think this is really in a way the central question for, for Central and Eastern Europe, and this predates COVID, but it may well get a bit of a push as well in a positive direction from, from, from the COVID crisis, is how to move from imitation to, auto, to, to, to innovation in, in, in the region's economy. So I linked to one study at the bottom. We actually have quite a few uh, studies on this. We've done, we've done various, various papers. And this, the, the, the central point is this. On the left, you have the smile curve. I think probably everybody knows what the smile curve is. So the bottom, the, the value chain functions, and on the left, the, the value added creation. And what this shows is that if you go along the value chain, the real value is in R&D, headquarters services on the left, logistics and support services on the right. And relatively little value is created in the production part of the value chain. The issue for Central and Eastern Europe, and this, if we move to the right of, of the slide, I show with a comparison of the Czech Republic and Germany, but this could be any, basically any Eastern European country, any Western European country, they all look the same is that Central and Eastern European countries, here the Czech Republic, is very much specialized in this production part of the value chain. It has very little specialization in headquarters services, R&D, logistics support services. Those kind of things remain in the headquarter countries in, you know, more often than not Germany, but also Italy, France, the UK, Austria, other, other Western countries as well. And so the real value added creation parts of the value chain remain in, in in, in Western Europe, essentially. And we, this we see as a huge barrier in terms of further convergence. This 
model can take to the Czech Republic to say 70, 75% of the German per capita income level, but it will not, or our hypothesis is that it will not take the Czech Republic, which is the most advanced country in Eastern Europe, uh, up to up to 100%. This is not the model for, for really for further convergence. And we see a sort of uh, stu stuttering of the convergence process uh, at around this level. And it really needs this move from imitation to innovation in the region. And it may well be the case that with this push, for example, in digitalization that I spoke about earlier, that the coronavirus can deliver a, a kind of boost in a way, a kind of push in innovation. We know crises can push innovation in general that will help Central and Eastern Europe to specialize more in, in, in other parts of the value chain. I'm almost at the end of my time, so I will skip, as I said, I wanted to, to emphasize four parts. Um, I will skip the next two, which are anyway a bit more political. One was just to talk a bit about Chinese influence, especially economic influence in Southeast Europe. And the other one was about the, the expanded role of the state in, in economic life, which I think will come uh, as, a, as a result of this crisis and what that means. Uh, but, you know, they're there if, if you want to if you want to read those later. I, I won't talk about them now. So I will conclude. So three points to conclude. Firstly, I think, as I said, much less spread of the virus in Central and Eastern Europe than in Western Europe. But that me doesn't really mean that the, the economic impact will not be severe. And we see the severe economic impact and I think it will. It will continue at least for the rest of this year. For the next 18 months, the region is vulnerable, I think especially Southeast Europe, but it also has these big factors of, of resilience. And I think the international support is very different after 2008, and that especially is, is good news for Central and Eastern Europe. And in the long term, I mean, I, I, I touched only on these points uh, quite briefly. I think there are challenges, there are opportunities, but there's nothing fundamentally new for Central and Eastern Europe as a result of this crisis. It's much more an intensification of the existing challenges, the existing opportunities facing uh, the region. So I will stop there. Thank you very much. And, and I'm happy to, to answer any questions that you have. Thank you, Richard, for these interesting uh, uh, um, uh, picture on what is happening in the eastern countries in Europe. I will immediately give the floor to Andrea and then I, we, we will have the questions uh, collected later if there are any. Thank you Andrea uh, and welcome. Are you able to, yeah, the slide, yes. Okay, uh, first of all, thank you very much uh, for the invitation. Uh, it's, a, it's a great pleasure. Um, I was in touch with you, with uh, Professor Cappello, the ISRE organization, uh, in view of the organization of the 2020 event. So I can only confirm the huge effort, the big dedication in translating uh, a physical event uh, in a web event. We also, the European Commission, have moved all our events online as every organization. I can only confirm how difficult uh, is to organize such uh, such tools. So a big thanks to the ISRE, uh, big thanks to Roma Tre for making uh, for making this event possible. So my name is Andrea Conte, I'm coordinating the group on regional economic analysis and modeling at the Joint Research Center, the science service of the European Commission. We provide evidence-based policy support in a number of areas. Uh, so uh, what I will describe to you are basically the different line of research results we have made uh, in uh, supporting policymakers uh, in uh, addressing this big uh, societal challenge like the COVID crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, beyond that, uh, my also objective uh, is the following. Uh, I have the opportunity to speak to you, to the Italian Regional uh, uh, Economic Association Group, uh, since our role is to generate a bridge between uh, uh, organizations, uh, science organizations and policy making, I make a call to you to get in touch with us to make the regional science activities at the center of the economic policy support. Uh, we are here also to help you and to make sure that we can put the maximum value added in terms of political visibility to the original and novel research you can make in addressing such important, such important topics. The structure of my presentation will provide you so with all this evidence, you can then uh, 
uh, make your own reflections on the areas in which there is a policy activity, policy request, uh, and how you can translate this in terms of your ongoing activities in the area of territorial, territorial analysis. I like to uh, always uh, convey a refrain, which is the, uh, let's say, the, the reason of our activities in terms of territorial modeling in supporting of horizontal policy, namely that most of the policies now uh, will be clear also in my presentation, also policies that go beyond economic policies will have a, a territorial impact. So the territorial angle together with the sectoral ones is fundamental in the moment in which the policy making community is addressing uh, responses that are relevant for the European citizens and society. So I will zoom from the general overview to, to, to the regional policy, to the territorial quantitative type of analysis, which is our bread and butter activity in the, in the joint uh, research center in the team of regional, regional modeling. There are eight major areas of public response uh, organized by the commission in collaboration with member states from public health to jobs and economy, uh, research innovation, digital fighting information and travel. I will not describe those aspects, but you have on the web a lot of evidence and legal detail. The web is organized on the coronavirus response as a one stop shop for all of you which have a specific interest in the legal and economic analysis underpinning the legislation that uh, European institutions have done uh, in these months. I give you just an example of three major areas. Uh, some example of how this non strictly economic activities is relevant in providing you with the regional type of evidence that you can use then in uh, for your own uh, for your own analysis. Uh, we have all the information obviously on the travel and transportation restriction that has been put in place, which refers not only to passengers, but only also to the to, the, to ensuring the free flow of goods and services throughout the single market vis-a-vis -vis per countries. There has been a lot of issues related, initiatives related to public health, uh, from the vac vaccination strategies to the treatments which has been funded by RNI funding. Last month it was announced that we were uh, um, given 23 new research projects uh, uh, through the Horizon 2020 funding, which is part of the coronavirus global initiative steered by the Commission in order to streamline and make cooperation uh, helpful and effective in fighting the virus. And through the European Commission Crisis Management Laboratory, you can have regional information on the diffusion of the epidemics across EU member states at the regional NATS2 level and beyond. So all the countries which basically are part of the network for analysis. You can then combine this with economic information for your own research purposes. There are a number of examples. I would like to also highlight to you the important side effect, dramatic side effect that these viruses have brought to the public opinion, which is the huge disinformation campaign that has been launched uh, let's say in parallel with the diffusion of the viruses. Uh, fake news, uh, bots, uh, conspiracy theories, uh, online scams which are attacking EU citizens. Um, the EU has put in place a number of tools, has provided a lot of free available data with also territorial uh, granularities uh, in this area. All the information by the European Center for uh, Disease and Prevention Control, the official agency of the European uh, institutions uh, in charge of uh, these aspects and then the two initiatives on the fight against disinformation and the COVID-19, this is made by the Joint Research Center Media Surveillance, where you can have big data with the possibility also to tailor territorially on the way in which on the news uh, the issues related to COVID has been appearing. This is using uh, machine learning uh, techniques uh, uh, through the Medicis uh, portal, which is basically the medical uh, machine learning uh, system of media surveillance is possible to disentangle or to extract relevant information on this area. Going to the economics, uh, there has been a reshuffle, huge reshuffle of the economic policy in different areas 
of competence of the European Commission from the governance, uh, the entire process of uh, fiscal policy coordination through the European semester has been changed to sector specific initiatives related to the securing essential food supplies and protecting critical European assets and technologies, the functioning of the European uh, single market, everything has been moved to support sectoral support like in the case of tourism, everything has been moved in order to uh, counteract the, pa the pandemic. Also cohesion policy has played a role in this, uh, in this, uh, in this effort. Almost all countries have already changed their, uh, their own strategies in order to, to counteract the economic impact of the, of the crisis and up to 90 programs have been amended uh, already operationally uh, across Europe. In the case of Italy, some examples are, for instance, the recent initiatives by the regions of Emilia Romagna and Tuscany, which have already implementing initiatives of supporting short-term projects to counteract the pandemic through the use of the regional development, development fund. There has been the big answer in terms of macroeconomic policy. Uh, in the media, especially in the Italian media, everything, all the attention has been given to the recovery and resilient facility. But in reality, there are three major pillars of the initiatives, which is uh, changing drastically the budget for the period 2021 and 2027 by adding the dark blue part you see in my, in my pie there. The next generation EU program, which uh, uh, encompass uh, a lot of uh, uh, new financial instruments for supporting investment uh, and reforms, uh, the green, the twin transition, the green and digital transition at the regional level, the key support for technologies and value chains across, uh, across Europe. Many of these initiatives have been uh, highlighted and defined in terms of uh, regulatory frameworks uh, through the cohesion policy treaties. And actually, what is important to highlight, uh, I would like to you to show this graph, uh, the way in which the recovery and resilience facility has been assigned to member states a define. The annex uh, one of the regulation which was agreed by the Council back in June uh, is providing you the technical details for those of you which are interested um, on the way in which the division of the funds has been allocated to member states. So um, again making a reference to some of the discussion on media and social media in Italy on the way in which the recovery resilience facility will be used. By, by the Italian government, uh, I think it's important to signal that uh, all those instruments uh, are mostly rooted uh, in the legislation for cohesion policy. Uh, the Commission, given, let's say, the need to act quickly and the need for flexibility, has given freedom to member states for uh, the allocation to sectors, regions, or the funds which will arrive. You see from the uh, graph from the table included in this slide that basically the big recipient of the funds are uh, Italy and Spain. But you can see also from Annex 1 the way in which the, the calculation has been made. The calculation based on population, inverse GDP per capita, average and employment rate, with some cuts which are longly described in the Annex, give you a flavor of the, let's say, how similar this allocation is to what is generally used in terms of financial support to, to regions and cohesion policies. Now, on economics, the uh, activities that the JRC as an institution has made in the area of socioeconomic analysis, from macro to regional and sectors reshuffle of the uh, forecast uh, activities and some specific analysis uh, related to the value chain. In particular, the trade slowdown and the relationship within European member states and regions, a fair part, the parties, notably China, and the global demand uh, industry shocks, which have uh, uneven territorially and sectorally uh, hit uh, the, European, the European economy. Uh, the labor market obviously has seen a lot of segmentation. I will show you an example of some research done in this analysis with the relevance for territorial analysis. 
and then there was an ongoing, still ongoing activities in supporting policy measures, policy makers in terms of the definition of the exit scenarios. Um, we are really uh, witnessing a strange, uh, dramatic period. Uh, the situation is changing over time, so new techniques, uh, uh, given the standard delay in the provision of available data, like now casting uh, and other data, big data techniques, uh, are used for supporting almost on real time the definition of the potential impacts of new lockdowns, partial lockdowns, and exit scenarios where, when we were into the lockdown. The territorial aspect, I don't have time to go through all those, all those analysis, is relevant in this exercise. It's relevant because this uneven, totally asymmetrical shock to the European economy has affected, has affected sectors and regions differently. The main message we, we like to pass, uh, we passed, is that first of all, the economic consequences of the crisis do not necessarily mirror the epidemiological damage caused by the pandemic. The degree and the granularity of the lockdown, the inducing effects on the value chain, regional, national, and beyond, are obviously generating an effect uh, over time across sectors and regions that could not be considered exactly uh, specular to the one of the epidemiological damage. Obviously, this represents an additional burden for economic analysts in terms of the identification of the territorial challenges that we will have ahead. The territorial aspect is one pillar. There is the social aspect, which is another pillar. Uh, through our tools uh, in the Joint Research Center, we were able also in particular for the Euro mod, model, the core tax uh, modeling framework to assess the impact in terms of, so, of different income classes of the EU. And we see that again, uh, the toll uh, on households is very different across into the income group to, the, uh, to which the households are belonging. Therefore, policy measures should benefit uh, low income classes uh, because of the expected increase in poverty without policy measures in places was uh, and will be quite, quite high. Um, an interesting activity is all what I'm mentioning is available uh, on our web page. Another interesting activity is that highlight the specificities of the, of the COVID crisis is the role that telework could play in exacerbating the existing labor market inequalities. Colleagues, uh, uh, been working on um, this aspect uh, and highlight uh, how different is the probability of uh, keep going uh, through telework, uh, telework instruments depending on the sector in which you are belonging, the type of occupation you have within sector, also your personal social condition where again, but then uh, for uh, income level, especially gender divisions, could be exacerbated uh, by the need of moving to digital many activities that were done so far, so far live. Now, again, zooming again, next step on the regional uh, level. Uh, we are using a tool which I will not describe because I don't have much time on the territorial impact assessment analysis. It's a standard computable general, computable general equilibrium model for the 270 NATS2 regions in Europe, those models are generally used to assess the, the impact of policies. So they work as a deviation from the baseline and allow to identify direct, indirect, and induced effects. Very quickly on why we focus on a territorial model, which uh, is of course different from natural tools, and the two main values, which are also the two areas in which most of the team is working in terms of scientific development, refers to the sectoral proximity and representation of the regions of the European Union through a full sector, uh, full matrix of regional input output tables and social accounting matrices for all the region and the spatial configuration through satellite information that allow us to identify the territorial accessibility of each region in the European Union. Again, for all this analysis, you have uh, 
uh, working papers which describe the methodology. We are very keen in establishing collaboration also with the, uh, with the, with the research uh, communities, with universities. We have used Romolo, and this was a kind of a first ever that the regional tool is using the main, mainstream uh, macroeconomic policies activities. In the document that President von der Leyen was presenting to the parliament, uh, in order to kick off, to prepare for the next generation EU program. We have been working uh, constantly with the different economic services of the European Commission in order to come out uh, with the most updated, uh, giving into account that we are in a very changing environment uh, from one week to another, but in order to come with the most updated, reliable information in order to estimate at the macro level the impact uh, of the COVID crisis uh, on EU region, an exercise that we made in line with the spring forecast of the European Commission and therefore can be read somehow, somehow in parallel. Uh, this was done basically by three main tools. What I showed you before is the macroeconomic results on your left side of the slide, where we basically focus on the macroeconomic effect tailored by country and sector, by which we touch both the supply and the demand side of the economy. But then there was also the complementary request of moving into sector specific analysis and value chain analysis. And for this purpose, we have been working, I don't have time now to go in, into the details of this slide, but we have been working basically uh, with the Romolo input-output data system. The input-output data system has been used basically for providing rolling uh, scenarios for quarterly analysis in which we assess the potential impacts on sector or subsector of the different uh, uh, full lockdown, partial lockdown, and escalation process that uh, was is under discussion in this uh, in this month. This is an example, for instance, on the way in which these maps were produced for the tourism, which together with wholesale trade, transport, accommodation and education are the sectors mostly hit by the crisis. I conclude my presentation here. I hope it was not very long. I pass the floor to you. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Is it is OK? Yep. Thank you, Andrea, for this interesting uh, speech. Uh, a, a lot of new information on how the European Commission is moving on uh, with policies, interventions on the problem of COVID and your very interesting first uh, scenarios. Uh, and I really look forward to reading them. Uh, we will also present our first uh, attempts, uh, scenario attempts in uh, in a, one of the of the parallel sessions. And I think we are the first to try and go at the regional level with these kind of uh, attempts. I open the floor to questions. Uh, let me see how uh, Yeah, uh, you can, uh, I think, uh, send the question or get uh, 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 the word uh, try. We are in streaming, and that's a little bit more com complicated than it will be in the parallel sessions where we will be able to. But in any case, questions are welcome. Otherwise, I have a very short one because uh, I was really interested in your, um, let's say, uh, statement, Andrea, where you were saying that uh, regions react more, uh, the, the, the disaster, let's say, the problems of the pandemic is not very much re related to uh, the length of the pandemic itself, but uh, on the crisis, on the characteristics of the region. Which are the most important, in a one minute, <laughs> which are the characteristics that are the most important in order to be resilient for a region? In, what did you get in, in, in your well, results? In very shortly, sectoral diversification, um, because the, the shock, uh, for instance, we have noticed a big impact in regions which have been virtually not touched by the pandemic. And this was due to the high exposure to, in, to trade, uh, imports and exports within the single market and beyond. So there has been a huge disruption in the value chain. There is a huge uncertainty which is affecting some sectors more than others. Tourism is the easiest case. 
So by playing on the sectoral uh, specificity of the value chain, we can get some yeah. long term damages. And I think that's exactly the message that also Richard gave. Uh, uh, that's exactly in line with what we got. OK, so I thank you very, very much for these interesting uh, talks, all of you, uh, of uh, the three of you. Uh, and I thank uh, also the, the participants. Uh, I remember that the I remember to you that these uh, are uh, these plenary are in streaming so that's something it's it's been a, a huge effort to do that so i hope uh, uh, we are we can be seen by uh, everybody in the world so i think we will be uh, we will have a, a result on that so i um, uh, start we have now a coffee break unfortunately not together uh, but we can enjoy your coffee break as like as, um, in a way that you like and then we reconvene uh, for the sessions at 11.15, okay? Thank you very much again for to our you. inviters uh, and Thank thanks you. for your very great spe speeches. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.